Welcome to Gamer Gods and Gamer Geeks, focusing on the people in gaming, their stories and inspirations. Today's story is on David Hemingway. David Hemingway has been creating highly detailed maps and tile sets on Roll20.net. I think it's best I just go straight to the source here and describe what Roll20 is all about. Roll20 is a suite of easy to use digital tools that expand pen and paper gameplay. Whether you play online via our virtual tabletop or in person utilizing our character sheet and dice rolling application, Roll20 will save you time and help you focus on enhancing your favorite parts of tabletop gaming. Roll20 for me really revolutionized how I've been playing. I've had a lot of friends that have moved to different cities over the years and now we're all playing together. With the boom and rise of D&D 5th edition these days, this has been part of it. You know, there's a ton of games that are being played and there's millions of people playing it on Roll20 now, which is awesome. Roll20 wouldn't be complete without the artists who contribute to the marketplace. Artists such as Russ Hapke and Dan Walters from the GamingGeeks.net and are early adopters on Roll20 and produce just a ton of tile sets. And they even have some isometric stuff, which is amazing. But I'll be focusing on them later, especially Mimic Chess they've created, but that's another video. David Hemingway is one of the artists who has produced over 25 incredibly detailed maps and tile sets for Roll20. Two years ago, David left the newspaper business as a graphic designer and never looked back. Now he's creating tile sets, maps, buildings, and props you can find on the Roll20 marketplace. He also does illustration for the games industry. You can see his work in Cold Bowl Press's games among many. David has been a DM for over 35 years and like the most of the DMs, rarely gets a time to play. His passion is Pathfinder and he has all the books and modules for it. You can find him crafting his art in his home studio along with his two beagles named Jack and Milo. David's work is highly detailed and consistent on Roll20. He spends hours creating very realistic maps and tiles from treasure chests and dungeon props and furniture to a secret cultist lair and a hillside fortress. Just zoom in on his work and you can see his attention to detail. Let's take a look at his biggest creation, Mansion of Mystery. The Mansion of Mystery is a four-story Victorian-style manor house which lends itself to fantasy, historical, and steampunk role-playing adventures. With over 50 rooms, the mansion can serve as a backdrop for a variety of stories, from attending an elegant ball to solving the case of a gruesome family murder. Or maybe your heroes have earned enough to afford a fancy new home base. This set contains 241 items, including four different base maps, day, night, and a blank version which you furnish as you wish, and a mystery version. This map can be used for mini games from Call of Cthulhu to Pulp Noir, whodunit murder mysteries, and even, yes, Golden Age superheroes. I used it for my 5th edition D&D campaign as a noble mansion of the player's arch villain. The project soon got bigger than he had imagined. The Mansion of Mystery is David's biggest creation. It started off as a humble project, making a simple haunted house. He had previous success with his Leaky Barrel Tavern. This project had a day and night version. Little did he know it would impact the creation of his Mansion of Mystery. The project soon got bigger than he'd ever imagined. Like many GMs, one is constantly thinking and adding more and more to an adventure. This happened with this Mansion of Mystery when he started creating it. He initially wanted to release it in October of 2017, but it all changed with his creative imagination getting a hold of him. This involved in adding a ballroom. A hidden lab behind a secret door in the wine cellar. The wine cellar. An Avery. A music room. An observation room with a telescope. And a two floor library. Flash forward to December when he decided to invest heavily into making this his best map of the year. He decided to clean everything up and added three versions. He had created a night version for his Leaky Barrel Tavern set. 
Now he created a night version to add to the spooky feeling of the Mansion of Mystery. He had a huge challenge creating the Victorian furnishings and set pieces. You can see this work on his pre-configured sets. These were specific for the theme of this map and added more time to the project. Each room had a theme and he created elements to match it. David added a third version of the Mansion of Mystery. He had a day and night version, now a third version being a blank one. This way DMs can furnish it the way they liked. David has many other tile sets in the marketplace one can be used to fill the rooms on his blank version of Mansion of Mystery. These are the furniture set one. He expanded it with the furniture set two. But then you could pop over to his dungeon props one. A dungeon props two. And even the marketplace where it has amazing stuff you can put in for the kitchen and such. Along the way he had many challenges making this map. He spent three hours alone just on the tea cart with the dishes and silverware. If you look at the smoking room in great detail you can see the individual cigars on the box on the table and pipes around the room. The autumn version had randomly scattered leaves which took him what seemed forever. This is his favorite version. Might as well for it adds to the spooky feeling of the house. One of his favorite rooms is a mad scientist or necromancer secret lab. This contains weird machines, torture tables, and a glowing green tank. You can even see test tubes in this room. What I really like was a wine cellar. It has a little separate private tasting room where one can sit and enjoy a sip. Just look at the detailed lace on the table. There's writing in the kegs along with the wine bottles have, with their labels that blew me away. Take a close look at the table. In the wine cellar you actually see a corkscrew and some glasses. Now let's take a look at the finished Mansion of Mystery I used for my D&D 5th edition campaign. The Mansions of Mystery really saved my butt as a DM, so thank you David. What happened you ask? Well, my players, who I notoriously named the wrong way raiders for a reason, and uh, well, they went the wrong way in my uh, dungeon that night and they cleared it out in like an hour. So we had like four hours left to play at least. So I was strapped for what the heck do I do? What did I do? Mansions of Mystery to the rescue! I decided we're going to have a 30 minute break and I put this together in 30 minutes. Yes, 30 minutes. Because David's stuff just snaps all together. He's got everything done. It's already filled um, with all the chairs and couches and all the features and everything like that. So I literally um, used the key, ad-libbed with traps and such like that, threw some monsters in and there we began. So let's go through the walkthrough of what my players did in the Mansions of Mystery and what I did for the first couple of levels. I'm not going to go into the uh, second, third, and fourth in the roof because well, my players are probably watching this, so I don't want to give them any spoilers. So let's see where they went. As you can see, the entrance is beautiful, right? You've got beautiful cobblestone the statue there leading up to the front doors. So you can see there's two of the players, Copper Tone and Frug One Shoe Shepin. He's the gnome arcane trickster and she's a ranger, a elven ranger. And yes, that actually is a Gutherzi. What happened was um, the players had an arch enemy since level one. He was the reeve of the town they decided to move into. And he was lawful evil, not a nice guy. And since the players are some of the players are lawful good and good, well, you know, they just couldn't do the murder hobo thing and just take him out. You know, you know, they needed proof and stuff. Well, they're now level 16, and they thwarted many of his plots on their way to level 16. And well, they uncovered the biggest one, and he was arrested by the Baron and hauled away in chains to be sentenced and tried. But along the way of leaving town, they wrote, they wrote uh, some mind flayers showed up and liberated him. So the players, after they cleared out my dungeon unexpectedly in an hour, were um, commissioned by the uh, spy master of the Baron to go figure out what the heck was going on inside the Baron's house. Sorry, the Reeves' house. 
and that's where the player started. So they came across a trap here in the door, of course, and they set off to explore. So inside, they found a beautiful alabaster staircase going up in a statue. In the left room, they found um, the music room. Then actually, not a piano. I had it as a harpsichord. Well, you know, because pianos don't exist in my world, but harpsichords do. So I made do. Then the next room was a sitting parlor room, right? That's the infamous uh, tea cart that David took three hours to make. Uh, and then they explored another sitting room, right? And then working their way through, they discovered the next building being the library. It's two floors, pretty amazing. They didn't go up, they just went to the next room, which was a statue of a horse. And he was modifying the statue of a horse, the evil reef, with himself riding it. And he had uh, some people carving another statue of him that they're going to place on this horse. Then they found a study with stairs leading down, right? But they stayed on this level. And then this way they found the carriage house leading outside with no carriage, of course. Beautiful stove in there. This is all roofed, by the way. It's a nice sheltered carriage house with stairs going down. But they stayed on this level. Then they discovered this beautiful dining room. It's just such a beautiful dining room. Let me show you the detail in that dining room here. As you can see, there's beautiful cups and lace, and the fireplace and wood. It's in the carpet. It is stunning, David. It's such a stunning work. There's painting on the walls, right? Then they discovered a fully stocked kitchen. So, you know, when you're hanging out here doing some long rests, what better place to have it but a fully stocked kitchen? Some of the food had spoiled, but a lot of the dried fruit and the dried meat and stuff still was there. So, you know, they could, you know, help themselves. At the Baron's expense, they found stairs going up. And over here, they found uh, servants uh, where servants would eat. Uh, and the workroom for the servants is there is going down, but they stayed here. They checked outside and they found a greenhouse with glass. Yeah, it's pretty cool. In fact, I think the player is going to be moving in here next. So. so they did some more exploring and they found a big porch out there. And which way did they go? Well, they decided um, the barbarian and the, and the uh, cleric decided with the elf and the gnome, they're going downstairs. So let me show you the basement. So they took the main stairs down that was in the study and it led right into the wine cellar. As you can see, it's such a beautiful wine cellar. There's the tasting room and all the bottles, right? And as they were exploring through the wine cellar, passive perception checks were made because clerics have an amazing passive perception check, especially a dwarven one. And they found there were some breezes coming through here. They're coming across the dwarf's, dwarf's face. So they explored and found a secret door, but they left that just still. They went to explore more of the area. So they found an area where you had the servants' parlor, it's not the servants' parlor, the servants' uh, workroom and pantry, right? And then uh, the laundry room, right? Then they uh, decided, yeah, let's go through that secret door. So going through the secret door, they found um, trouble in the mad necromancer's lair. The, uh, the evil reeve had a second command, was a necromancer. So what did we find in here? Flesh golems, lots of them. Six flesh golems. So after that uh, fight ensued, the barbarian was just hacking and slashing and berserking rage. They cleared it out. And they discovered the necromancer's workroom. Right? And include, they have indoor plumbing. So the players decided they are going to definitely uh, move in. Uh, these are pumped. Uh, there's little pump handles there. So you actually have to pump the water. Dwarvis Innovation. So they explore more of it. And they came down a long passageway into the sewer area. Right? Of the city, the town they're in and they discovered a hole going down. They didn't go down this. Um, they haven't explored that area yet, but um, that is a beautiful hook for David's cultist lair. So you could actually tie that in um, and you could go right to the next adventure. So this could lead to the next, which is pretty cool. But they explored more. And uh, this is where they found the uh, Githurzi in the cell. Um, since the um, Baron, evil Baron, sorry, the evil Reeve, the Baron's a good guy, the Reeve's a bad guy. 
um, the reeb was um, liberated by mind flayers, there was a Cthulhu in there, thus, you know, adding more to the plot. So they rescued him. He seemed to be some sort of monkish type that spoke all languages. Then they found a workroom. And inside the workroom, they found this beautiful grindstone. You know, you've got, uh, you know, building supplies, saws. They're doing upholstery. There's the wagon wheels, because just above here is the carriage room. So the players went upstairs, and that's where we left them to be. I'm not going to go into second, third, and fourth of floors, uh, being the roof, because, well, you know, my players, they're going to be watching this. And, you know, sorry, wrong way, Raiders. I'm not going to give you an easy uh, easy time at the next level, so you're going to have to figure out what lies above level two, three, and the roof. So stay tuned to see what Frug, Coppertone, Skald, and Rurik will be up to next with the Wrong Ray Raiders. Will they go straight to the top? Probably. They're probably going to skip the level two and go straight up to the top. That's my expectation. That's what they usually do. So we'll find out. Feel free to check out David's work on Roll20.net. Hit him up on Twitter. He's a great guy. He's very engaged in the community. Um, yeah, it's well worth it. He's got so many great tile sets, so many great maps. They all work together. And he's such a pleasure to interview. So enjoy. And remember, everybody, play all the things. Take care.